Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin session one titled Peace in Korea, Peace in Northeast Asia. This session will be moderated by Professor Ko Yu Han of Tonggung University. Professor Ko, the floor is now yours. Uh, Good morning. We are going to begin the session one of the Korea Global Forum for Peace 2019. The theme of this session is Korean Peninsula, Peace on the Korean Peninsula and Peace in Northeast Asia. We've heard from the keynote speaker and also the opening and welcoming remarks. And I'm sure that you are well aware of the developments on the peace talks on the Korean Peninsula. I believe uh, this process started with the Moon Jae-in administration, but in order to complete the process, uh, we believe um, active engagement and uh, cooperation among the four countries, um, China, Japan, and the two Koreas. So this peace building process uh, is uh, one of the key um, elements and the objectives of the Moon Jae-in administration. And that initiative was uh, outlined in the 2017 Berlin uh, statement. And now we are looking at uh, more concrete uh, steps towards that goal. I believe uh, Kim Jong-un, chairman, uh, North Korean leader, has shifted uh, its uh, national uh, focus from the uh, you know, two-track approach, the nuclear development and the um, economic advancement, to uh, more focusing on a, the economic development. So countries involved in this process are uh, seeing their interests are being met in this process. Through the April uh, 17 Panmunjom statement uh, was uh, the first concrete step towards the uh, process. I believe uh, that was the start of the process. So in the Panmunjom statement, although the statement was made by the two Korean leaders, but in terms of uh, peace regime building on the Korean Peninsula and the denuclearization, I believe Panmunjom statement uh, provided the blueprint or framework in that goals. So we are in the process of uh, developing action plans to make that um, goal a reality. But in the second summit meeting between U.S. and North Korea, I believe a deal was not made. And we are um, at a deadlock at this moment. So under this backdrop, uh, Xi Jinping, the president of China, uh, appeared in the scene. So I believe th that uh, in order to complete the process, uh, we need uh, the you know four players cooperation: Kim, Moon, and Trump, as well as Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is going to visit North Korea from tomorrow, and uh, he, he will meet uh, Kim Jong-un. So it remains to be seen um, that uh, whether the Xi Kim summit meeting will provide yet another momentum uh, to the current peace process and denuclearization process. And a series of summit meetings are planned. Uh, the Moon uh, Trump summit meeting and also Chinese leader 
and the U.S. leader will meet uh, on the sidelines of uh, the G20 meeting. So under this backdrop, this is a very meaningful forum organized by uh, the Ministry of Unification and Sejong Institute, and this is very timely forum. So without further ado, let us begin the session one. We have Mr. Cho sung Yer, advisor, uh, and uh, previously a senior research fellow at the Institute for National Security Strategy. So he will uh, provide the overview of the denuclearization strategy or the peace uh, process that is currently going on. So please. Yes. Uh, good uh, morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation to this uh, Korea Global Forum for Peace 2019. And in particular, when it comes to peace and denuclearization policy of uh, Moon administration, which I'm going to explain, I'm very thankful for this uh, opportunity. Moon Jae-in government inaugurated in 2017 when the Korean Peninsula was at the height of tension and conflict since the truce in 1953. Chairman Kim Jong-un developed intercontinental ballistic missile so, and also uh, hydrogen uh, bomb uh, uh, test uh, was also successful. So the tension was at its height. President Trump warned of military action against North Korea, uh, mentioning fire and fury. Under such circumstances, uh, given that there is a heightened um, possibility of war on Korean Peninsula, the President Moon uh, administration was inaugurated. In his Independence Day address on August 15, uh, he said that there will be no military action upon the Korean Peninsula without Seoul's consent, and the Korean government would prevent war on the Korean Peninsula by all means. He also said the uh, South Korea had no intention to collapse the North or pursue unification by absorption, and respected the uh, inter-Korean um, agreement. Uh, so he actually changed uh, the uh, basic policy of the inter-Korean uh, Relations. He also uh, said we needed to resolve all our problems through conversation and proposed uh, to make uh, Pyeongchang Winter Olympics become the first step toward peace on the Korean Peninsula. Thereafter, um, Chairman Kim Jong Un possibly responded to uh, Moon's proposal to participate in Winter Olympics in his new address, New Year's address in January 2018. Inter-Korean talks that was then revived through Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, which smoothly led into inter-Korean summit and the signing of the April 27th Panmunjom Declaration. This also uh, made possible the Singaporean summit between um, North Korea and the U.S. So new era has opened on the Korean Peninsula. But I think still the biggest challenge ahead of us is that as the uh, international community is well aware is of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is also uh, in at core from different roots uh, than the peace regime of the Korean Peninsula. The issue of peace regime and Korean Peninsula was once mentioned during the Geneva political talks between April and April 54 under the military amnesty agreement and was discussed along with the issue of military tension reduction at the four-party talks involving the two Koreas, the U.S. and China, between 97 and uh, 1999. So at the four-party talks, the f uh, talks is focused on reducing tension on the Korean Peninsula, and the other was having peace regime on Korean Peninsula. Until 1999, the uh, nuclear, nuclear issue in North Korea was not mentioned because North Korea was secretly developing nuclear weapons, and at that time, it was not adopted as a formal agenda. The nuclear issue of North Korea started to become a um, key agenda item from 2000 through the high-ranking meetings. 
there was a uh, adopt the uh, U.S. North Korea adopted the Geneva Agreed Framework, and uh, six party talks started between 2003 and 2004. Then in July 2005, the North Korean Foreign Ministry demanded peace or guarantee system on the Korean Peninsula as condition for North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons program. Uh, with the fourth uh, six party talks, the North Korean nuclear weapon issue started to be linked to the peace regime of Korean Peninsula. So since early 1990s, North Korea has refused to hold a military armistice committee as stipulated in the armistice agreement, which put the military army system in Korea Peninsula in jeopardy. To resolve this issue, we had four party talks among two Koreas, United States and China, but this two, four party talks uh, was not really uh, helpful toward resolving the tension in the Korean Peninsula. Then uh, Kim Jong-un uh, promised to give up nuclear weapons in March last year, and so, so there are two conditions for that. First is the guarantee of regime security and resolution of military um, and uh, military threats. Uh, he, he, he said that he's willing to give up uh, nuclear weapons if these two conditions are met. This one, I do believe, is very important uh, proposal. It's not only about the nuclear of Korean Peninsula, but since 53, for more than 60 years, the armistice regime that continue Korean Peninsula could, uh, with this as an opportunity, be uh, Fin complete, uh, complete or finished. So, peace regime in other, and denuclearization can be tied together and should be dealt together as a result. As I said before, for the nuclear weapon issue, uh, the six party talks started in earnest in 2003, but it comes with few uh, constraints. For 23 months uh, through pre negotiations in 2000, uh, 15 in September, comprehensive uh, agreement was uh, taken. That is the uh, na uh, September 90 joint statement. Through, based on the comprehensive um, agreement, the step by settlement and step by implementation were made through the February 13th agreement and October 3rd agreement. But this agreement did not uh, really go to full denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Second, the six party participator and the U.S. negotiator was uh, the six party participated, but the, as I said, the was represented by the U.S. negotiator by assistant secretary, which meant that uh, U.S. took a lot of time for coordinating their opinions and in key uh, decisions Going to the top decision makers' final uh, confirmation took a lot of time. Third, while the negotiations were going on, Japan, one of the six-party talks, started to raise the abduction issue, which was not part of the official agenda and did not refuse to provide 200,000 tons of heavy fuel oil promised to North Korea. So North raised, um, North uh, stopped uh, disabling uh, North uh, then, of course, uh, refused to partake in the further negotiations. So given the above mentioned experience of four-party talks and six-party talks, it is desirable to pursue the denuclearization and peace process on the Korean uh, Peninsula in the following ways, given that the uh, uh, these efforts all ended in more or less uh, in uh, failure. So the lessons we can learn from this is first, the peace process on uh, Korean Peninsula is a four-way process between the North, the U.S., and China. As you know, since the uh, in the 1953 Armistice Agreement, uh, US, Korea participated through UN, but North Korea, U.S., and China are the parties to that Armistice Agreement. This meant that to guarantee peace on Korean Peninsula, the you, we need all the engagement of these parties. But the process for easing military tension is uh, engaged, should be engaged through different player. At the late 1990s, at the four-party talks, two Koreas, U.S., and China all took part. 
But at that time, already China was saying、uh, did not have military presence on Korean Peninsula, and since it was not、uh, party to the armistice.、Uh, Agreement talks, so that became a continuous issue. So in the future, Turks, I believe the peace process in Korean Peninsula needs to be、uh, UN, US,、uh, China, and the North Korea. While the easing of the military、uh, tension、uh, could be between two Koreas,、uh, US and China, I think that is the more effective way. And another thing is that、uh, we have. Double two-party talks between two Koreas and North Korea are、uh, needed. So, of course, three parties, North Korea and the、uh, U.S., needs to meet. But、uh, given that it's not possible, I'm suggesting double two-party talks. And this one, some limitation have been revealed, but still, some is the top-down method is valid. But The State Department of the U.S. and President Moon,、uh, as proposed in his Oslo、um, speech, before the、uh, summit、uh, talks, high-ranking talks maybe should、uh, proceed. Thirdly, through high-level talks, U.S. and North Korea should first push for a comprehensive agreement on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and several partial settlement implementation should proceed to build trust and achieve early、um, results. This is to、uh, prevent another failure, as we saw in the Hanoi talks. So. Between Koreas and the U.S. through high-ranking、um, meetings should have some tangible achievement before we ultimately go to the summit uh, meeting uh, talks. And at the summit meeting, the denuclearization can be、uh, resolved through the decision by the leaders. So comprehensive agreement and partial settlement and implementation, and through the third U.S.-North Korea summit,、uh, which will. Find, uh, give final stamp on the agreement could be the step that could be proceed. So, through the Singapore Declaration and Panmunjom Declaration, we could see、uh, have promised to make、uh, advancement in the Korean relations and the U.S. North Korean relations. But as you know, at the Hanoi talks,、uh, we failed to、uh, come to an agreement. But Despite such limitations, the Hanoi meeting is still very was very meaningful. First, two leaders met, and for a lengthy time, fundamental issues between two countries were discussed at length. So they were able to understand each other's position, which itself is very meaningful.、Uh, of course, the nuclear issue, the chasm was not、um, narrowed, but there is.、Um, Offices that is going to be liaison offices in Pyongyang, Washington, to be established, and the, so there were some、uh, progress made. So、uh, at this moment, North Korea transcended that it would explore new paths after shocking collapse of Hanoi summit. However, it will be difficult for North Korea to obtain expected result as long of as、uh, as long as Iraq U.S. collaboration is maintained fir firmly. For North Korea, it won't be easy to return back to its old path of Pyongyang line. Parallel development policy for the parallel development of economy and nuclear weapons as well. If North Korea resume its strategic provocations through a nuclear test and test fire long range ballistic missile, which the North promised to suspend in relation with China and Russia, will be significantly undermined as well. As our、uh, Unification Minister said, time is no on no、uh, body's side. North Korea.、Uh, If, even if it carries out strict provocations, it would be able to continue to manufacture nuclear materials, warhead, and missile while improving their performance. So, when it comes to issue of time,、uh, North Korea and even the U.S.,、uh, the time is on, not on their side. It will be easy for President Trump to change his calculation method that he presented in Hanoi. However, he may be. Difficult, have difficulty in focusing on North Korea talks after the start of president campaign in earnest, and Chairman Kim said that he will wait until the end of the year.、Um, 
And uh, so given the fact also South Korea has National Assembly session in uh, April. So North Korea could wait until the end of the year, but if there's no some kind of agreement before that, that uh, strategic provocation could be at our um, hand at uh, early part next year. So to avoid that, denuclearization uh, efforts and peace process on Korean Peninsula should be pushed forward with more honors. Above all, South Korea and the U.S. denuclear negotiation, we should give it top priority. North Korea, if they put the um, nuclear issue on back burner, provo strategic provocation could be the inevitable future. So based on uh, cooperation, South Korea and the U.S. should do all its efforts so that the negotiation can start sooner than later. From uh, tomorrow, President Xi Jinping is visiting North Korea. So between North Korea and China, some kind of, uh, pro uh, I hope, uh, agreement can be made for the denuclearization. So in that fact, the fact that President Trump is visiting uh, South Korea in late June, when there is some talk between South Korea and the U.S., the denuclearization process that is at stalemate since the Hanoi meeting um, can be resumed. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Frank Janoji, CEO of uh, Maureen and Mike Mans. Thanks so much. It's my great honor to be here this uh, morning in Seoul and to address such a uh, engaged and educated audience on the subject of the future of the denuclearization and peace processes on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the uh, summit in Hanoi uh, so far has yielded a rather meager harvest, uh, notwithstanding uh, the progress that uh, Minister addressed this morning on the uh, military agreement between North and South to try to reduce tension, to try to uh, ensure that uh, traditional hotspots like the West Sea uh, fishing areas uh, along the DMZ as well uh, would not uh, resume uh, uh, sort of uh, hostilities between North and South. Uh, and despite the uh, uh, advent of uh, family reunification virtual visits, uh, over television screens, I think um, any candid assessment of the, uh, the, the progress on peace and denuclearization uh, over the last 12 months would have to conclude that uh, progress has been um, agonizingly slow uh, and that the, uh, the actual fruits of the initiative have been meager. Why is this? You know, uh, is this because the, 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 the parties to the conflict are uh, uninterested in peace? Uh, is it because they're not committed uh, to a denuclearization and peace process? I, I don't think that's a fair assumption. I think that the, uh, the, the reasons for the lack of progress are, are directly linked to some fundamental miscalculations on the part of the United States, principally, uh, but also on the part of North Korea. The Trump administration uh, has placed extraordinary faith in the ability of sanctions and uh, military uh, uh, posturing uh, to compel North Korea to come to the bargaining table with a flexible attitude. Um, and in fact, when you saw the uh, announcement of the Singapore summit, uh, the Trump administration took pains to declare that this was a direct result of the maximum pressure campaign of the Trump administration. I think this represents a fundamental misreading uh, of the situation in Northeast Asia and also North Korea's situation as well. Uh, sanctions, uh, without question, sanctions uh, will limit North Korea's economic future and sanctions do impose a cost on the North Korean economy. We know this. Uh, and yet, when you look at some fundamental measurements of the North Korean economy, like the price of rice or the availability of electric power or the exchange rate of the North Korean won, uh, we do not witness, uh, we do not observe uh, any significant uh, disruption in the North Korean economy. To the contrary, uh, we see signs of economic growth, uh, uh, we see signs of investment, 
Uh, we see signs of improved access to, to electric power uh, and modern consumer goods for the elite in Pyongyang. So to the extent that the sanctions are biting, it seems not to be biting on those in a position to make decisions in the North about the North's future. And if anyone is suffering, it's, it's more likely uh, the 80% of the population uh, who live uh, outside of Pyongyang uh, and who are already disadvantaged. So I think the Trump administration fundamentally assigned too much credit to themselves and the maximum pressure campaign as having somehow compelled North Korea to the table. In reality, I think the North came to the table for, for at least three reasons. Sanctions was part of it, the desire for sanctions relief. That was part of it. Uh, but more fundamentally, uh, Kim Jong-un had consolidated his position as leader of North Korea over a five-year period uh, and over a 18-month intensive nuclear and ballistic missile testing regime, uh, he had consolidated at least a limited a nuclear deterrent capability, which gave him the confidence to engage with an American leader uh, from a position of relative strength. Um, second really important change happened here. The election of President Moon Jae-in uh, and the advent of a progressive government uh, in Seoul which was interested in and open to negotiations with North Korea. Uh, the North Koreans are not going to engage in a peace process if they don't think they have a willing partner for peace. And uh, the advent of the, sorry, yeah, the advent of the Kim uh, uh, Moon channel meant that for the first time, North Korea believed they truly did have uh, a, a willing partner for peace in South Korea. So these three reasons, uh, consolidation of power by Kim Jong-un, uh, a more uh, open negotiating partner in the South, and the desire by the North to get out from sanctions, led the North to, uh, to come to Singapore to explore what, if anything, was possible uh, with the mercurial uh, President Trump. Now, the, the meetings in Singapore and Hanoi, uh, we cannot escape the strategic backdrop for these meetings. They take place against a strategic backdrop of a growing U.S.-China strategic rivalry. Uh, and I think Professor uh, Shi Yin Hong and I agree uh, that this uh, U.S.-China dynamic uh, is in an unhealthy place uh, and one in which the U.S. and China are increasingly viewing each other as strategic rivals rather than strategic partners um, in East Asia. And this has important consequences uh, for the coordination mechanisms uh, that the South Korean government hopes uh, will uh, uh, lend uh, positive influence uh, on the negotiations for peace and denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Um, now, it's uh, my view uh, that the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy of the Trump administration and China's Belt Road Initiative and new era of great power relations uh, 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 thinking. Uh, it's my view, frankly, that neither uh, the US nor China are truly pursuing a grand strategy uh, in East Asia. Uh, I think these are very useful uh, ideological frameworks, uh, very useful rhetorical devices, uh, but that uh, uh, I take my lessons from my former boss, uh, Senator Biden, uh, who told me uh, more than once that strategy without resources is not strategy. Uh, and so for the Trump administration to declare that they have a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, but then to have no trade policy to go with it, no resources to go with it, uh, no State Department assistant secretary to manage it, um, no defense secretary to manage it. Um, uh, this is not strategy, this is rhetoric. Uh, but even China's Belt Road Initiative, which does have resources, I would argue is not really strategy either, because it's not coherent. Almost every Chinese foreign investment around the world, whether it's in Latin America, or, or <laughs> Chile, South Africa, or, or the Netherlands, is being labeled as part of the Belt Road Initiative. Um, so I think the Belt Road Initiative lacks uh, a purpose uh, beyond simply expanding China's commercial uh, uh, access uh, to markets. Uh, uh, 
of course, China wants more influence in its near abroad, in Central Asia and Southeast Asia. That's only natural. Um, but the Belt Road Initiative is not the answer to that problem. And in fact, we see more and more countries responding to the Belt Road Initiative with some skepticism. But nonetheless, this strategic rivalry does exist, even if the uh, strategies of the two great powers uh, are, are somewhat incoherent. And it's leading to zero-sum thinking on the Korean Peninsula. And this is very unfortunate uh, for the peace and denuclearization process here. Uh, I can tell you, uh, coming from Washington, uh, that there is a bipartisan uh, skepticism about the role of China in the, the Korean peace and denuclearization process. It's not only President Trump who publicly uh, expresses his concern that maybe Xi Jinping uh, is undermining rather than strengthening his uh, outreach to Kim Jong-un. It's also Democrats on Capitol Hill. It's also Republican lawmakers on Capitol Hill. Uh, the skepticism about China's role is profound. And although I am here in Seoul today, I can promise you that if I were in Washington on Thursday and Friday, uh, the news about Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un meeting will be reported with deep skepticism. This will not be viewed uh, by Washington as a helpful development uh, for the peace process. Uh, and I think this speaks to the larger U.S. suspicions about China's long-term intentions in the region. Uh, and even, I believe, uh, that China's uh, engagement on the Korean Peninsula um, is complex. And it's not only that, uh, yes, China wants a denuclearized Korean Peninsula uh, long-term, uh, but it's also about where China's influence will be bounded. Uh, will China's influence on the Korean Peninsula be bounded at the, uh, the Yalu River, uh, at the 38th parallel, or Pusan? Um, and I think uh, for the United States, they increasingly view China's role on the peninsula through that lens. So where are we headed? Um, I think there will be a third summit. Um, but for that third summit to be successful, uh, we need to learn some lessons from the second summit, uh, which was a fiasco. The second summit failed because of inadequate preparation. And so far, I see no signs of adequate preparation for a third summit. Uh, third summit should have the details nailed down in advance. It should be the opportunity for the leaders of the two countries to ink agreements and to uh, initiate concrete steps toward peace and denuclearization. But for that to happen, uh, the, the negotiators must meet at the working level, and they must meet more than once, uh, and they must haggle, uh, and they must argue, and they must seek advice from their home capitals, and then return to another round of working level talks. None of this has happened. Uh, moreover, it's not even clear that the US has the personnel in place to manage the process. Uh, I know Steve Began very well. I, I worked with him closely on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and I have deep respect for him and admiration for him, and he's a very skillful negotiator and a very uh, a smart person with deep integrity. All of that is not enough. Right? He also has to have the Chuan Li. Right? He has to have the authority to negotiate uh, on behalf of the U.S. government, and unfortunately, no one has that authority because Trump is a unique character who does not bestow authority to anyone around him. So Began can negotiate with North Korea uh, for months, and Trump can come in and destroy that work uh, on a whim, and the North Koreans know this. So this complicates Began's work. There needs to be negotiations about the scope of denuclearization as well as the scope of sanctions relief that will be provided in exchange for those denuclearization steps. The two sides are far apart on this. And there also needs to be a commitment to 
accelerating the pace of the peace process, uh, ending the Korean War, establishing liaison offices, improving the overall political dynamic, and the two sides are far apart on this as well. So while I think there will be a third summit, I'm not optimistic about its outcome because I don't see the preparation underway to ensure success. Uh, now the good news is um, I'm probably wrong. Uh, I've been wrong about a lot of things on the Korean Peninsula. Anyone who's been involved uh, on the Korean Peninsula for more than a few years uh, measures your engagement by how many mistakes you've made rather than by how many successes you've made. Uh, and there's a lot we don't know about the Korean Peninsula. When Biden interviewed me for my job, uh, advising him on the Foreign Relations Committee, he asked me uh, a very simple question. Uh, he said, what are the three most important words you will ever say to me? And I had not prepared for that question. I thought he was going to ask me about China or about Korea or Japan. So I said, I don't know. And he said, exactly. He said, don't bullshit me. If you don't know something, you just say, I don't know. So there's a lot we don't know about the Korean Peninsula. Um, and maybe some of you in the audience can help us figure it out. Um, but what I think I know about North Korea uh, is that they will not part with their nuclear weapons easily. And they will not part with them all at once, the way that John Bolton and Secretary Pompeo would prefer. And so unless the United States adopts a phased, reciprocal, gradual approach to the denuclearization challenge, um, I'm afraid we are unlikely to, to make much progress during the remainder of Trump's first term. And there's a danger that we may approach the goal of denuclearization in a way that the mathematicians in the audience will understand. I'm not a mathematician, um, uh, but I believe that there is much that math can teach us about the goal of denuclearization. And, and we have been approaching it uh, asymptotically. This means we are always moving toward the goal, but never getting there. This is a very dangerous way to approach a foreign policy objective because on the one hand, you have the illusion of progress. Actually, it's the reality of progress. You know, you're, you're getting closer to your goal. And so you remain confident in your approach because you think it's working. But you may never get to the goal because each step uh, is a smaller step. Uh, maybe that's good enough. Uh, to close on an optimistic note, um, we could do a lot worse on the Korean Peninsula than to approach the goal of denuclearization asymptotically, always approaching it and never reaching it. Uh, because the time of greatest danger has been when we see a reversal of our direction, a movement away from the goal. Uh, and that's when we see the escalation of tensions and a resumption of the bluster uh, and, the, and the, the, the risks of conflict uh, increase. Uh, so on that somewhat optimistic note, let me uh, close and look forward to your questions. Thank you. 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 우리 그 잔우치 대표님을 뵐 기회가 있었는데 그때 말씀하신 내용 중에 북미 6.12 공동성명의 내용과 관련해서 미국이 오독하고 있다 미스리딩 오늘 미스 캘큘레이션 뭐 이런 말씀 많이 하셨는데요 그래서 이게 오독인지 오도적 무시인지 그 저희도 이제 그때 참그 말씀을 상당히 그 의미 있게 받아들였고 오늘도 어 비건이 권한이 없다 비건이 사실은 잠정 합의를 만들어 놓고 트럼프 대통령이 이제 빅딜을 내서 이걸 그 노딜로 끌고 갔는데 아마도 막 트럼프 대통령은 당시에 이걸 그 잠정 합의를 받았을 때 
에, 국내 정치적으로 좀 몰리는 상황에서 외교적 실패로 인식되는 데 대한 부담도 있었겠지만 김정은 위원장의 완전한 비핵화 의지를 아직 확신할 수 없다 그래서 빅딘을 던져서 받으면 아마 의지가 있을 거라고 본거 아닐까 그리고 이제 그 영변단지만 그 연구 폐기하고 그 제재를 풀어줬을 때그 먹튀할 거 아니냐 그냥 그 군축으로 핵군축으로 가고 보유하려고 하지 않겠냐는 그런 아마 우려가 있었던 게 아닌가 하는 그런 생각을 해봤고요. 또한 가지 아까 그 바이든이 말씀하시기를 헛소리하지 말고 모르면 모르라고, 모른다고 해라 얘기를 하셨는데 어 제가 그 들은 내용 중에 트럼프 대통령이 집권해서 그동안 전략적 인내를 하는 동안에 이제 북한의 핵미사일 고도화를 막지 못한 데 대한 이제 재검토를 하는 과정에서 본페이오를 이제 CIA 국장으로 임명하고 불러서 당신 너는 북한에 대해서 얼마나 아느냐고 물었답니다. 그러면서 이제 농구 선수 로드먼만큼 알아 그렇게 <웃음> 물었답니다. 그러니까 어, 뭐그 본페이오가 CIA로 돌아가서 어, 코리아 미션 센터를 만들고 앤드류 킴을 센터장으로 임명해서 이제 본격적인 그 협상을 시작했다는 얘기를 들은 바가 있습니다. 주제가 지금 이제 미국 입장에서 비핵화 문제를 다루었기 때문에 그리고 아까 그 중국의 일대일로라든가 중국 문제도 언급하셔서 순서를 그 중국 쪽 말씀을 쟁점을 좀 부각시키기 위해서 어그 중국 측그 말씀을 먼저 듣고 어그 영국에서 오신 그 전문가 분께 그 발표 기회를 그좀 바꾸는 게 좋을 것 같아서 그렇게 음. 양해를 해주시면 그렇게 하겠습니다. 그러면 그 중국 인민대학교 국제관계원 교수로 계신 스인웅 교수님께서 어, 발표해 주시겠습니다. Thank you very much, and uh, chair. And uh, first, I would like to pay my profound gratitude to the Ministry of Unification here and the s i j o n g Institute, and gave me. such a wonderful chance uh, to discuss one of the most important problems and uh, today in the world. I would like to uh, display a spirit of completely frankness, like my friend and uh, the previous American speaker. And also I would like to, you know, to broaden the picture and uh, to discuss the peace, denuclearization, and the difficulties of dialogue and negotiation over North Korea problem in the, in the broader context of Sino-American rivalry and, and the China DPRK relationship. I firmly believe that since Jin j o n g the surprising initiative launched in the first day of last year, North Korea problem had dramatically changed in a historic way. With Jin j o n g n s holding of strategic initiative as a primary feature of the process, together with great boosting for both peace and uh, dialogue for denuclearization from our key government headed by Plan Wang. Thereby, the danger of military conflict in Peninsula was drastically you know, cut down, while some benign change of nuclear problem became almost inevitable. Secondly, Jin j o n g n suddenly v e t o Beijing toward the end of much last year. resulting in a rapprochement of China DPRK relations. And why interpretation? In my firm belief, I think obviously the later drastic change of China DPRK relationship came from the former, the dramatic change of North South relations in the peninsula and j i n j o n g n and uh, by both initiatives launched by 
uh, Chairman Jing Jong Un and Panda Wang. Faced by the forthcoming historic great game with Trump, as well as with Panda Wang, and King Jong Un felt to be not so self confident. So he required China some psychological backup to encouraging in the great gambling and some reassurance for preparing for the possible worst scenario, together with the hope to obtain Chinese economic help. For my president Xi Jinping, at that time, Peninsula, which has been vitally important to China in secret terms, could soon have historic major changes. But at that time, China was bypassed almost deliberately by all three major players in the firming process. And this was very disturbing. So the two sides, Beijing and Pyongyang interests, suddenly compatible with each other. The most decisive fact for the drastic change is that North Korea has possessed or is very near to possessing operational nuclear middle-range missiles, while has provided, which has provided at least a minimum nuclear deterrence, at least in the eye of Jin Jong-un. Just because of this, Pyongyang can for the first time afford to engage in genuine partial denuclearization, including dismantling nuclear intercontinental missile, uh, uh, ballistic missiles, ICBM, as long as it obtained from Washington, what the Jin Jong Un emphasized repeatedly as faced and synchronized concessions. In fact, the world has seen a change in North Korea, anticipating in some sense the future a perhaps minimum nuclear state with more peaceful and diplomacy-oriented foreign policy, or even somewhat reformist domestic one as well. How could one achieve much better result than this in reality? And this is what I refer to first. I would like to speak very, you know, realistically, completely on my personal point of view and without connection with the Chinese government. I will turn to sino American relationship. Throughout 2017, Trump had a strategy toward China that was to make China-U.S. relations a prisoner of a single issue, the issue of North Korea nuclear and missile development. China seemed, as of the year, to be tamed largely through Trump's extraordinary threat of military strike against North Korea and of secondary sanction against China. Beijing has been near to exhaust its instrumental pressure against Pyongyang, while the corresponding political and strategic costs, especially the possibility of making North Korea become China's permanent enemy, would necessarily be high. In South China Sea throughout 2017, Planet Trump's freedom of navigation operations surpassed Obama's in both frequency and intensity. Together with the highly publicized initiative for quadrilateral Indo Pacific Strategic Coalition for checking China, predatory became the administration's standard adjective to define China's economic process, uh, practice in the developing world, bent and load initiative in the first place. Moreover, the concept of sharp power and acquisition of China's ideological drive within the advanced countries emerged, reflecting a new dimension of China-U.S. rivalry. In early last year, 2018, we almost suddenly found an external picture of severe rivalry or even confrontation between Beijing and Washington at 
both trade and strategic fronts, and even more. Having used up China's utility in North Korea, President Trump began to apply the generally same strategy and tactics to the China-U.S. trade front. Successive brutal threats to impose high tariffs on China's export to the United States. Maximum demand ready to squeeze concessions as much as possible. Tough negotiation position alternated with a little softer ones. And Trump machine has launched massive efforts for restraining China's high tax trade and it happened with a comprehensive and a severity almost to the degree of blockade. At the same time, Trump has much intensified the rivalry against China at the strategic front. China, along with Russia, has formally defined as the U.S. primary rival in short, mid, and long terms. Trump signed the Taiwan Travel Act, unleashing high-level official visits and direct consultation between U.S. and Taiwan if U.S. plant decides them requiring any equation. Public or secret military ties with Taiwan is closer. Or secret, uh, together with some dramatic diplomatic support given to Taiwan. The United States Navy warships has greatly increased their frequency going through Taiwan Strait. Moreover, the advocacy for Indo-Pacific Quadrilateral strategic coalition, the technological renewal of U.S. strategic armed forces, almost all of this range had been launched. Besides, condemnation against China's human rights situation have abruptly returned to the agenda, together with accusations against the claimed massive interference by China in American political election political system and public opinion. Condemnation of China's political system, social control, and so-called ide ideologizing at home has gone to rampant. All of these have made the dramatic rise of ideological rivalry as the most prominent trend in the China-US relations in the past three quarters. Now let me return to North Korea problem. The principle of fixed and synchronized progress has been the most important one of Jin Jong-un for negotiation with the Trump administration, in which a substantial reduction or even final abolishment of the sanctions against North Korea has constituted the most urgent demand the disregard of that by Trump and the request of a speedy CVID without a substantial gearing led to a lack of real progress in denuclearization since the Singapore summit and collapse of Hanoi summit. Up to now, the prospect of third U.S. North Korea summit is almost increasingly dim accompanying with damaging actions taken by both sides. It's plausible that even if the third summit would realize later, it still might produce so little. Although China still insists on denuclearization of peninsula and on implementing UN Security Council's sanction resolutions, but does the United States have the right cause to expect the China corporate visit over North Korea problem when the United States has pressured China so harshly and damaged China's vital interests in other fields so severely? Should China abandon the limited rapprochement with North Korea and return to the previous situation in which Pyongyang was increasingly likely to become Beijing's permanent enemy. 
a precondition for substantial progress is that the United States change its basic approach and do things according to the principle of fixed and synchronized mutual concessions. And this China is, I believe, not capable of helping much of the situation. Since early 2018, China has developed, I believe, according to my observation, its new position over the North Korea problem. In sitting as before, the objective of denuclearization of peninsula, but being no longer so radical about it to damage severely the new relationship as it were with Pyongyang. Second, supporting the elimination of legal state of war and military confrontation between North and South of Peninsula before the solution of the problem of nuclear arms. Third, endorsing North Korea's principle of faced and synchronized progress and taking a point of view that only through the mutual implementation of this principle by both Washington and Pyongyang called the North Korea nuclear problem gradually change in a positive direction. I firmly believe Beijing will insist this new approach and try to address a major dilemma it's now facing between complying with the UN Security Council sanction resolutions against North Korea on one hand and providing some economic help to Pyongyang and others for maintaining or even limitedly developing the new relationship mentioned above. Finally, for the immediately forthcoming Xi Jinping uh, summit in Pyongyang, my hunch is that this have a double purpose, tactical and strategic, short term and long term. And tactically speaking, and Xi Jinping will persuade Jin Jong-un to go a few steps to meet Trump. And uh, if get some minimum possible answer, and President Xi will use this in Osaka to persuade President Trump to go a few steps to the Jin Jong-un. But the effects on both Jin Jong-un and Trump, I expect, would be quite limited. China's capability to pursue Jin Jong Un, especially in the face, of, in, in, in the same time, China still, you know, implement quite seriously sanction resolution of Secret Council is quite limited. And of course, China's persuasiveness toward Trump will be even less in the context of comprehensive tension and all exchanges between Washington and Beijing. And strategically, and for long term, I think that China, of course, is not so stupid to forget the requirement. At this juncture, China would like to mobilize all international forces whatsoever to, you know, to, 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 to not on Chinese side, but not on American side. And anyone, and in this sense, I think Xi Jinping's visit to Pyongyang is similar with his visit to St. Petersburg to hug Mr. Putin and then to Central Asia to smile and make further cooperation with all of those forces which called in the long term China-U.S. rivalry, not on the side of U.S. side, uh, no, not, not on the side of U.S. side. So I think that this is and China's, what China have to do, and even without, even without a, a, a systematic grand strategy. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
다음은 영국 채텀하우스 스님 연구원으로 계신 존 닐슨 라이트 위원님 토론 발표해 주시겠습니다. 네. Thank you very much. And let me uh, begin by thanking the Sejong Institute and my old friend uh, Pei Kak Soon for this wonderful opportunity to talk to you today. Um, my remarks are going to, I think, echo very much what has been said already in terms of underlining the importance of particularly the, the role of South Korea, I think, in acting as a catalyst for some of these changes that have taken place. Um, I'd like to to offer a European perspective. Whatever may happen with the Brexit debate over the next few weeks and months, Britain for the moment at least can feel European. I certainly feel European. Um, uh, and perhaps that can help expand our discussion a little bit. But to, to go back to what I was saying earlier, I think it's really striking to emphasize the importance of um, leadership, and particularly the role of President Moon, who I think has shown a remarkable patience and agility in terms of negotiating in a very difficult environment. Um, some of the success that has been achieved to date, and it is real success, I think must be attributed to him. But it's also a function of, I would argue, important structural changes. The decline of what Charles Krauthammer used to refer to as the unipolar moment, the fact that America now has to operate in an environment with, in which its power is compromised. But also, of course, the extraordinary personality of Donald Trump um, and the unpredictability that that creates. Uh, and something that we haven't yet talked about, which I think is also equally important in understanding the limits of working across countries, which is the role of um, anger and um, some of the populist pressures that we've seen, which have been, at first glance, concentrated very much in the European context. But I think in understanding some of the mistakes that Donald Trump has made, in terms of the way he frames diplomacy, we need to understand how internal domestic politics uh, constrains and limits leaders and also contributes to some of the mistakes that we've seen. Um, for President Moon, I think you know, his, his boldness um, is a reflection of many things. One, his own personal history uh, and the legacy of having worked with uh, uh, President Kim Dae-jung and Noh Moo-hyun, of course, in terms of his commitment to reaching an accommodation with the North. Um, and very much, I think, the skill and success with which he laid the foundations for that very important uh, PyeongChang Olympics and the summits that have developed since then. Um, it's also, I think, a reflection of his acute psychological astuteness in managing that difficult relationship with Donald Trump. Uh, and I think it's worth emphasizing how sharply things have changed from the fire and fury days at the beginning of the Trump administration to at least in terms of Donald Trump's own rhetoric, his belief in, that he can develop a personal relationship with the North Korean leader. And in that, again, I think we need to emphasize the importance of the success of President Moon, who not only, of course, has reached out to the North, but has also, I think, quite cleverly and sensibly um, done this without compromising on issues of security um, and maintaining credible deterrence at home. And that has to be, um, I think, emphasized. Um, but of course, all leaders depend on luck uh, and contingency, um, the luck that Donald Trump was willing to change course, and the luck that in Kim Jong-un, President Moon had a remarkably um, confident counterpart, uh, a, a man who has demonstrated his, his own tactical astuteness and his own, I would say, psychological acuity. I was struck by the way in which um, he too uh, has, I think, learnt the importance of flattery and bringing on side uh, his own interlocutors, whether it's from South Korea or in the case of the United States. Um, and we shouldn't underestimate that. Um, we've talked a little bit about strategy. Um, it's hard to say with any confidence that Kim Jong-un has a strategy, but I think so far in the time that he's been leader, and certainly in terms of his commitment to summit diplomacy, we see evidence of a long-term strategic plan or a willingness to play a long game. And in that, of course, he benefits from his own structural advantages, not having to, um, to deal with the challenges of electoral politics. Um, how do we assess, I think, the success to date uh, of the summits that have taken place, Panmunjom uh, and in Pyongyang, and of course those important 
summits between the US and North Korean leader. Well, I think certainly, again, from the South Korean point of view, the emphasis on past agreements is hugely important, and we shouldn't un underestimate um, the importance of re-stressing how much has been achieved in the past, and the foundation that agreements such as the uh, North-South Agreement from 1991 might offer a useful foundation for future progress. Um, secondly, the importance of practical steps, practical engagement, and the litany of successes that have come out of the Panmunjom Declaration um, mm -hmm. and the Pyongyang meeting. The focus on um, substantive economic contact between the two Koreas, infrastructure development, military confidence building measures, uh, hugely important, of course, the establishment of a North-South liaison mission, the importance of humanitarian assistance, um, bringing into the process not only governments but also civil society, NGOs, uh, emphasizing the importance of healthcare provision and education. All of these things are clearly very, very important. But the reality, of course, and it's a sobering reality, is that none of this can move forward without the cooperation of the United States. South Korea remains, like it or not, a junior partner and therefore inevitably faces its own limits in terms of bringing on board the American administration. And while some critics might argue, given the, the freezing of some of that progress that has been achieved, uh, achieved to date in terms of practical engagement by the North Koreans, um, some, of, some of that has been interpreted as a sign of fickleness on the part of the North Koreans. I think it's, however, however perhaps more persuasive to explain the slowdown in progress in these areas as a reflection of both the shock of the failure of the Hanoi summit, which is very understandable, given the misperceptions on both the American and the North Korean side, but also, also important, despite the absence of any electoral constraint in North Korea, Kim Jong-un inevitably has his own uh, bureaucratic constituency, not least the military, and one imagines that the loss of face that Hanoi entailed must have at least given him pause in terms of thinking about the pace of future developments and future cooperation with the South. And we've seen that, of course, in the strident criticism of both John Bolton and Mike Pompeo. Um, the good news, I suppose, is that at least in terms of Kim's public statements, uh, in terms of his relationship with Donald Trump, he remains positive. Uh, and while there is frustration in North-South relations, the decision by Kim Yo-jong to uh, acknowledge uh, the, the death of Kim Dae-jung's widow and the commitment to some sort of permanent um, memorial uh, is a sign that at least in terms of North-South relations, uh, the North is signaling that it wants to continue. The key question is whether uh, South and whether President Moon alone, uh, despite all of his, his real achievements to date, can put the process back on track. And while we should acknowledge, I think, his patience, his energy, his psychological astuteness, his own strategic vision, um, it's clear to, to reiterate that he needs to work closely with his American partner. Let me say a few words about the lessons of history, because we heard a little bit earlier about the importance of the, um, the six-party talks process and the four-party talks process of the past. I think looking back on those events, um, it's useful to highlight some of the similarities and differences, because in important respects, both the four-party talks process and the six-party talks process have foreshadowed some of the challenges we face today. In the 1990s, of course, it was North Korea that focused on the importance of withdrawing US troops from the Korean Peninsula, um, an important part of the difficulty in reaching agreement on, on convening the four-party talks pre process. And security anxieties, of course, not least the launch of Teppo Dong in 1998, helped derail much of the progress between those four parties, particularly as Japan fa faced its own vulnerabilities and saw that as a basis for strengthening its security partnership with the United States in ways that were really quite unprecedented. Of course, it was in the late 1990s that we heard talk of a strategic partnership between China and Russia, something which remains, of course, a concern today uh, and may be a constraint in looking forward. And when it comes to the six-party talks process, of course, uh, the initial push to develop a, a multilateral dialogue was, of course, constrained by ideology, in this case, on the part of the Bush administration, which had, I think it's probably fair to say in those early years, a visceral dislike of the North Korean regime and its leader. Um, we shouldn't forget, of course, how 
the Americans were keen to emphasize that North Korea was part of an axis of evil. And that ideological framing, of course, is fortunately not with us today. And I think the, the progress that has been achieved in normalizing relations, at least in terms of some of the rhetorical pronouncements, is a healthy development. The six-party talks process, of course, was um, at times stalled uh, by bureaucratic interventions. Uh, historians will debate what happened in uh, the autumn of 2005 and the role of groups within the US administration to raise issues that complicated uh, dialogue between North Korea and the United States. Um, but once again, it illustrates, I think, the importance of having a coherent and unified approach on the part of all administrations, but particularly the United States, something which is arguably a problem to date. Um, and at the end point of the six-party talks process, of course, it was similar discussions about the nature of um, nuclear declarations that helped destabilize and ultimately undermine those negotiations, with the Americans challenging the North Korean declaration and raising, raising very important issues of verification in terms of how best to um, realize some of those early commitments. Um, looking forward, what can be done to move the process forward? Um, I think the premise that the North Koreans would be committed to ultimately a denuclearization agenda needs to be questioned. Um, the very uncertainty of the American political process, presidents come and go, inevitably will, re will raise real concerns on the part of Kim Jong-un about the reliability of any uh, commitment from the United States if an administration were to change. Trump himself, of course, has demonstrated in his negotiations with Mexico that his word cannot really be trusted. And the Libyan example, of course, has been cited by many as a powerful reason for why the North Koreans uh, are unlikely to give up their nuclear commitment straight away. So therefore, in order to move forward, the United States needs to be realistic. It needs to lower its uh, ultimate goals um, to take a a leaf out of economics, maybe we need a more a satisfying strategy in which the United States decides to, to lower its sights in the short term. What are the options? Could we see some sort of commitment to a nuclear freeze? Um, perhaps somewhat idealistically, could North Korea and the United States both be persuaded to sign the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty? It would give Donald Trump um, a unique moment to, to claim that he had done something uh, different from his predecessors and to put in place a mechanism for um, at least delaying uh, a deterioration in relations with the North and opening up op options for inspectors uh, to monitor North Korea's nuclear capabilities. Um, but there are real questions about uh, North Korea, about the US president's capacity to engage in the, that sort of tactical and strategic thinking. Um, the electoral logic of the 2020 campaign means that he is uh, unlikely to be, I think, willing to give that sustained level of attention to these issues. Some have talked, perhaps, of some sort of security accord as a second option between South Korea, the United States, and North Korea. Um, if North Korea is engaged in a hedging strategy, not yet certain whether its natural interests align with Beijing or with Washington, might that sort of agreement help to facilitate some sort of security accord? Uh, all of that, of course, is thrown into some doubt when one looks at the nature of the US-South uh, Korea security partnership. Structurally sound, but given this um, different style of politics on the part of Donald Trump, one can't um, not but ask the question, how reliable, if, reliable are US security guarantees to South Korea? Given all of the talk of um, the uncertainty of extended deterrence, statements by prominent American politicians, not just Donald Trump himself, of course, but even um, Senator Lindsey Graham, who is in some ways through his public remarks has um, threatened, I think, the integrity of the US-South Korea alliance relationship. And all the discussion about burden sharing um, and Donald Trump's statements in Singapore suggesting that he might not be committed to a full-term full extended um, sustained commitment of US forces on the Korean Peninsula inevitably raises very real and understandable concerns. A third option might be to say, as um, President Putin has suggested, of course, that the six-party talks process itself should be resurrected. But that seems um, highly implausible. Trump, by all of his statements and actions, is not, of course, a committed multilateralist. Um, is it conceivable that there is um, sufficient capacity in the US administration, given the progressive 
hollowing out of the State Department. Um, is it conceivable that the United States can work closely with some of its East Asian partners, uh, in including Japan, which has its own concerns about the reliability of extended deterrence, and given the disappointments that Prime Minister Abe must have inevitably faced as a result of the failure of his visit to Tehran, about how closely he can cooperate with the United States? And as we've just heard, of course, um, the tensions between the United States and China uh, raise similarly profound concerns about the reliability of multilateralism. So we are left, I think, therefore, with um, a fourth option, which is a type of what I would describe as a combination of ad hoc bilateralism and uh, partial multilateralism. And in this, of course, the role of mediators is hugely important, particularly the role of South Korea, not only in terms of those concrete steps that have been taken place between the two Koreas, but also a point that often gets overlooked, the role of rhetoric. And again, here I would commend President Moon for his statements in Oslo and Stockholm recently, reiterating the importance of dialogue and trust. In all of this, of course, other actors can play an important supporting role. European countries, of course, with their extensive history of formal diplomatic contacts with North Korea, including my own country, which has had some 18 years of diplomatic relations with the North, um, have a wealth of experience which they can apply in a constructive way to um, underline the importance of engagement. Um, whether that's through the use of NGOs uh, in specific technical projects, or very importantly, the role of education. My own university, Cambridge, has had the experience of receiving visitors from North Korea. And I think we need to look beyond the short and medium term to think about long-term progress and long-term change in North Korea, bringing North Korea into the international community by, by training a new generation of North Koreans who will be committed and knowledgeable about how best to engage with the international community. Um, but even Europeans, of course, face huge capacity constraints, not least my own country. Uh, and once again, in this context, we have to ask the question, how do you persuade your own domestic public opinion to support these sorts of initiatives? Britain has done a great deal, I think, in shoring up deterrence, in support for the United Nations Security Council process, in sending its own uh, maritime forces to East Asia to support uh, Japan and other countries uh, in maintaining efforts to send signals to North Korea and to maintain the non-proliferation regime. Uh, but that all, of course, takes money, and it takes resources, and it takes popular will. Let me finish with a few statements, again, to emphasize history um, and to echo what's been said already. Uh, in terms of short, immediate steps, uh, the idea of a US-North Korea liaison mission seems to me powerfully appealing as a means of creating a, a material, physical context in which trust can be built and developed between Washington and Pyongyang. Um, a peace declaration, if it can be realized, is important not only as a way of signaling long-term objectives, and I think it's important to signal long-term objectives, but also to provide some degree of recognition and status and normalization of North Korea as an international actor, not in, under, in any way minimizing the human rights abuses and the authoritarian nature of the regime, but according North Korea that respect will be an important way of binding it into the long-term process. Um, and in terms of a peace regime, to echo what's been said already, um, one can't help but support the South Korean government in its plan to develop that idea and that, um, that vision. But perhaps one can ask the equally important question about whether framing this as a regime is the most important and useful way forward. Perhaps we need to be more um, or less ambitious in terms of the way we frame these types of agendas, to talk simply in terms of a plan. And I'm mindful of the importance of thinking about the Cold War uh, and the role of the United States at similarly precarious points in international history, when plans, whether it was the Truman Plan or the Marshall Plan, were not only presented in a way that engaged with public opinion, but also were part of a bureaucratic process of great coordination and systematic and careful thought and attention. Um, much of the progress, of, of course, that was achieved in the Cold War in building cooperation with former adversaries was helped and facilitated by middle powers. And one thinks of the OSCE process as a good example. And the lessons of that process, of course, are well felt here in South Korea, um, not just by the current administration, but of course by uh, some of its predecessors. But the OSCC process, of course, worked because, of course, it had the support of the United States, which at that time was an engaged and leading player. 
and could be seen in ways that I think reflected a type of altruism, selfish, self-interested altruism on the part of the United States to work with its partners to support its own security interests, um, underlined by a sense of long-term objectives. The problem with Donald Trump, I would argue, and this is perhaps a reason to be pessimistic, is that there's very little evidence to suggest this is a man who has a plan or a vision or the patience to work cooperatively with other countries. And that's perhaps a downbeat note on which to end, um, notwithstanding all of the achievements that have been um, stressed by the panelists by South Korea today. Thank you. Stressed by the panelists by South Korea today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've heard from four panelists. We have about 30 minutes to conclude the session. So in order to stimulate uh, discussions at this session, I would like to propose five contentious points to discuss. In the peace building process on the Korean Peninsula, we need to define who are the um, actors. So far, we've uh, uh, talked about or uh, there were three actors, US, North Korea, and South Korea, and the engagement was, has been bilateral, I would say. but. One of the panelists said that uh, basically it should be the bilateral, but uh, um, as a complementary matter, tripartite or multilateral engagement has to be there. So after the collapse of the Hanoi uh, summit, um, inter-Korea relationship uh, is at a deadlock uh, at this moment too. And Xi Jinping visits North Korea soon. So whether Xi Jinping plays as a facilitator in this process or would they be uh, uh, more deeply involved in this process? Uh, I, that is my first question. And also, uh, Mr. chan chi and Mr. su yin both of you said that uh, the third summit meeting between the U.S. and North Korea uh, the possibility of the third meeting uh, is also deeming and also the outcome if it was held and then the outcome will be uh, will not be so pessimistic right so positive so I believe uh, the reason that you are expecting that uh, meager outcome or the possibility of the third uh, meeting is not really uh, promising uh, is that uh, there is lack of trust amongst the two parties, right? So North Korea uh, keep insisting that uh, they will not abandon the nuclear program completely before receiving anything in return. So we, we, in order to make progress in this process, uh, I believe uh, trust building between the two parties is uh, a must. Uh, Trump's uh, unusual character and also in a complexities around the nuclear program in the North. So at this moment, uh, the phased and uh, synchronized uh, approach proposed by Kim Jong-un may be uh, a path that uh, both parties should uh, work towards, right? So at this moment, how do we build a trust between the two parties? And once the process really hit the deadlock, I mean, we are in the suspension mode, but if the uh, process fails uh, ultimately, then I believe all the process, the background of this process and all the discussions and uh, negotiations, I believe the ultimate goal is to um, secure peace in this region and on the Korean Peninsula.
In the 1960s, China successfully developed uh, the hydrogen bomb, and uh, so two bombs, and uh, you know one uh, pro one another program was successful. Now North Korea uh, claims that their nuclear program uh, development has been complete. So under this backdrop, how do we? Uh, continue humanitarian assistance to the north. So how uh, would the Chinese government or Xi Jinping administration uh, involved in this, in this process? So for these uh, points that I just mentioned, I would like to ask the panelists to engage in discussions before opening up to the floor. So who will go first? Mr. Mr. Cho song -yeol? Well, uh, the fourth party talks in 1990s, uh, uh, US and China participated, talked about peace regime and about it reducing tension. But the situation has changed very rapidly now, as I said before. When it comes to peace uh, regime uh, issue, uh, China joining is inevitable and it's, uh, get, it should be that way. But in when talking about the peace regime, as now uh, North Korea, South Korea, and US, and when engaged, talk Talking about Korean Peninsula issue, when the timing of China joining is another uh, issue, as you know very well, when it comes to the peace regime on Korean Peninsula, the Pan Declaration, and also in June in Singapore Declaration, all say uh, talk about only uh, two Koreas and the U.S. So the key issue here is uh, declaration of end of world war. Uh, the peace, uh, you know, declaration, uh, declare end of Korean War. So, whether uh, China will join that in the early stage or in the uh, with the denuclearization in in the process of peace, signing peace agreement, could, could they join in? In other words, in the final stage, from tomorrow, as you know, President Xi Jinping is going to visit North Korea. So I think this is a key um, visit because up to now. If you see the reaction from the U.S. side, uh, first they were positive about um, peace declaration, but since uh, uh, July, uh, they are very sensitive about China joining in in the peace agreement, and they were kind of resisting it. But after in the pre-negotiation reading up the Hano summit, rather than seeing uh, end of war declaration, they were accommodative towards using the terminology peace agreement. Of course, that, that fell through. So I believe um, there is no like legally binding um, agreement. Hence, uh, end of uh, war agreement or as the peace agreement now uh, signing among three parties as we have done so far in terms of negotiation might be more desirable and once you have the declaration of the end of war after that China as I said before in, could join in the uh, peace process for Korean Peninsula, Peninsula so they, they joining at the final state might be more desirable and in the military uh, issue of the three parties currently North Korea recently they are not bringing the uh, the U.S. Army uh, leaving Korean Peninsula, they're no longer mentioning this. But here, if we tie military with the peace uh, issue together, then the uh, the ROC U.S. alliance and the U.N. Uh, presence in uh, South Korea could be talked more as is the U.S. concern. And that could, in terms of uh, then um, I think military issue again among the three parties uh, talk needs to be uh, started so that we can alleviate concern the North Korea and at the same time U.S. Uh, side their strategy the military strategy on the Korean Peninsula can be maintained. So military and. Uh, separating with the peace process, I think practically speaking, in bringing peace to Korean Peninsula might be more desirable. Then to Professor Shinu on China. I think that the thanks for chairs and uh, very sharp and important questions. And uh, first is that the over North Korea problem, my lateral, you know, 
institution arrangement, just like six pipe talks, this, uh, does it still require? I personally believe that. How can you believe? And now is 10 years later, six pipe talks and uh, indefinitely suspended, especially by North Korea. How can you expect that? Such kind of multilateral the, 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 the arrangement is still, you know, not only still required by North Korea, by the United States. I don't think that the, it's uh, realistic. And it's multilateral arrangement for North Korea's problem in any secret sense is definitely not, you know, wanted by both North Korea and the United States. Maybe some parties and other parties still want this multilateral mechanism in significant sense, just because those parties have a worry that in this process, this time or that time, uh, plan or future, and uh, they are bypassed by main parties. Second, is China well you know, engaged more deeply in this process? I seriously thought. And China have a dilemma at this moment. On one side, and China's relationship or China's persuasiveness on Jin Zhong un is limited by China's obligation to implement and especially pushed by other Western side and uh, South Korea to completely, seriously implement Security Council's sanction resolution severely limited China's, you know, leverage, persuasiveness in the Jinjiang side. Second, and China repeatedly in those Jinjiang's most important principle, and that is so-called face and synchronized process, uh, progress. So if China push Jinjiang uh, make a more substantial concession to the United States, Jinjiang only use this principle and will refute China. You already support my principle. I do something. Trump not gave me. And you want me engaging a game of only giving and no, no taking. So China will not use. Also, and uh, now the comprehensive tension between Russia and Beijing for China's motivation. Why China should help the United States over North Korea problem and uh, very much. There is no motivation, no such a driving and a force to push China to help Mr. Trump in his difficult game uh, with F North Korea. And also, and uh, maybe the situation is so dynamic, North Korea problem and is not a big, big potato, just like it for China in, for example, 2017, or something just like that. It's become, it has become a smaller potato, smaller than the Taiwan situation in China's eyes, smaller than developing in Hong Kong, smaller than trade war between Washington and Beijing, and so on and so. And also, and due to you know, the contribution, especially due to Chairman Jin and Panama, Peninsular situation is much more improved and mitigated. There is no real, you know, danger of military conflict in our eyes. So urgency much more reduced. This is also, I personally believe that will make China and to use this, use its limited energy to deal with other more urgent and dangerous problems. And uh, even there is a third summit between Washington and Pyongyang. I said that the prospect could be quite, uh, and might be quite dim. Why? Because first of all, we found a fundamental principle up to now on the side of Washington, on the side of, of Pyongyang is opposite, is, is fundamentally opposite. And uh, if we deprive the all of rhetoric, Trump's principle is still, 
you know, speedy CVID. This will be refused by Jin Zhong again and again. Jin Zhong's pr principle is face and a synchronous process, step by step and step by step. And also, both of them have a severe, including severe domestic political limitations. Because both Trump and Jin Zhong, and whether for their respective political interests or for their personal vanity, they want to get, you know, quick, big results, at least to could be publicized to their domestic audience. But big results and quick results is not possible. So they, although Jin Zhong uh, have a principle of face and synchronized process, and maybe this is really compared with his long-term strategy interests, but his domestic requirements and his personal vanity, just like Trump, and require something, not small steps, big steps. So this is self-contradiction on the part of Jin Zhong as well as on the part of Trump. And the trust, what is trust? And the market analogy is a perfect one. And they have a deal. And either side performs their deal. And they do not love each other. They do not say that, I love you, Jing Zhong, or you write a beautiful letter to me. And uh, clearly make some limited but real, you know, contract. Perform contract, perform contract. Then this process is repeated seven times. Trust between two responsible, good merchants established. Rhetoric is no use. Rhetoric only have a very short, in, a short effect of impressing people very temporarily. Every day, emphasis, chemicals between leaders. This is a small things. Chemicals could change. And we have a lot of volatile chemicals. You look at, you know, summit between the, 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 the North Korea and the, and, and the United States. You look at the summits between China and the United States. And if there is no realistic but determined consensus on both sides on fundamental principles for a period, for each other's national interests, and for diplomatic, you know, politeness, personal chemical is unreliable, especially from such kind of leader, so volatile. How can you, 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 you build up your, you know, mutual trust, you know, pro, the, 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 this task built on your too, too, too much belief about the big words. And big words could be changed quickly. And chemicals, chemicals are volatile. Finally, I think that the regional peace and appeal for development of the plus one between North and South, regional peace required and further mitigation between antennas between Washington and Pyongyang. And the regional peace required, this is perfect, but I, I doubt could not be realized finally. This the complete denuclearization. But in this region, the peace has also threatened by, for example, China-US arms race, by an increasingly support of the United States provided Taiwan by South China Sea problems. So I think that all of those threats are also real and increasingly you know, dangerous threats. So last words, people in Seoul don't think your corner is the most dangerous corner of the world. Thank you. I will, I will yield back my time to the audience. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, just a few thoughts in terms of external actors um, beyond the ones that have been mentioned. Clearly, a bilateral agreement between the US and, and North Korea is um, necessary. Um, necessary, but perhaps insufficient in terms of long-term change. 
Uh, there are other actors who can play a constructive role. We've heard talk of a possible um, a summit between Prime Minister Abe and uh, Kim Jong-un, a distant prospect, admittedly. But of course, Japan could be a huge facilitator of long-term progress if a normalization agreement were reached. Um, the model of, of the agreement between uh, South Korea and Japan in 1965 is often cited. Um, Russia, we haven't spoken much about Russia. There's been talk about um, an oil and gas pipeline as a basis for long-term cooperation. But as, um, as many analysts have pointed out, the financial incentives for this are pretty poor. But again, it's a vision, if you like, which might be developed. Um, if a third summit between Kim and um, Trump takes place, might the Europeans provide a venue? Might Sweden, for example, be a useful opportunity here? Small um, contributions, but still, I think, important. In terms of building trust, I think um, it's partly a question of managing personnel. Uh, within your own countries, um, preventing John Bolton from raising the issue of chemical and biological weapons in the Hanoi summit if Donald Trump had intervened, if that's the right interpretation of what happened, um, would have been a useful way of um, sending the right signals and minimizing misunderstandings. We've, of course, heard reports of a purge of officials in the north, and that raises very important questions. If, if trust is to be built by um, working level groups working together, how can you do that when there is uh, lack of clarity about who the right people are to talk to uh, on the North Korean side. Um, in all of this, I think the question of um, status that North Korea's nuclear weapons program provides to the North, I don't know how you um, deal with that issue. Um, North Korea, of course, has been seeking to develop its nuclear weapons capabilities since the 1950s, and reports I think credible reports that the success, both in terms of the nuclear program and the broader missile program, was well received by the elites in Pyongyang, um, raises a very important question. If you, if you lose that technical progress by giving up those capabilities, how do you maintain a sense of pride amongst your own people? And finally, if I may, I agree with you that um, chemistry is not necessarily um, enough. If it's the wrong chemistry, if it's chemistry based just on wishful thinking, but there is, a, I think, a, a more profound sense in which personal chemistry is hugely important. And that's not just true in terms of America's relationship with North Korea, but also more broadly in terms of relationships in East Asia, if one's thinking in terms of multilateral security uh, and cooperation between former adversaries. Uh, and in this context, the point I would emphasize is the importance of empathy. Um, and here there are useful historical lessons that we ought to um, cite and remember. Robert McNamara. Uh, on meeting his uh, former North Vietnamese counterparts, stressed that one of the important things was understanding the mentality of your adversary, being able to place yourself in their shoes. Um, understanding North Korea's point of view is hugely important. And again, unfortunately, to once again emphasize a very pessimistic conclusion, there's precious little evidence that Donald Trump is even capable of empathy, uh, not just with his adversaries, but even within his own cabinet and in the political process in the United States. So for that simple reason alone, we should be very worried. Yeah, 감사합니다. 그 지금 뭐 10분이 채 남진 못했는데요. 그 신뢰 문제와 관련해서 그 사실은 이제 그 양자 톱다운 방식의 이 그래서 그 판문점 선언에서 싱가포르 북미 공동선언을 넘어가면서부터는 이게 이제 3자 구도로 가긴 갔는데 그 이후에도 어 한미 워킹 그룹 중심으로 이렇게 에 한반도 문제는 평화 프로세스 중심으로 가고 북미 간의 비핵화 프로세스로 이렇게 이제 이원화되는 느낌이 있었습니다. 그래서 이거를 이제 남북 북미가 3자 워킹 그룹으로 가면 효율적이지 않을까 하는 생각을 저도 했고 건의를 해 보니까 어 한국의 역할에 대해서 어그 미국은 미국대로 북한 편들 거 아니냐는 의심을 하고 북한은 북한대로 어 미국 편들 거 아니냐는 의심을 해서 그냥 양자 톱다운으로 가는 게 편하다 이런 얘기를 제가 들 전에 들은 적이 있는데요. 어 그러니까 그 북미 간에 교착됐을 때 9월 평양선을 통해서 사실은 남북 합의란 형태로 영변 핵단지 연구 폐기와 상응 조치를 교환하는 협상이 시작됐는데 최종적으로 하노이에서 결렬될 때는 남북한 모두 
미국이 빅딜안을 준비하고 깰 의도를 갖고 있다는 걸 모르고 있었다는 그러니까 결정적일 때 신뢰가 무너지는 그런 부분에서 어, 지금 수습이 잘안 되는 것 같은 느낌이 듭니다 그래서 그런 부분에서 앞으로도 이 관련 국가들 사이 신뢰들을 이제 쌓아가는 문제 그리고 양자를 중심으로 가더라도 적절한 시기에 필요에 따라서 이제 그 다자로 확대돼 나가는 과정은 불가피할 거라고 보는데요. 지금 혹시 이제 그 점심 시간이 있고 그래서 어 많은 분들에게 그 기회를 드릴 수도 없고 5분 정도 남아 있습니다. 짧게 한두분 정도 어 코멘트나 질문을 받겠습니다. 네. 지금 두분그 니시노 선생님하고 이슈리 두분 이슈리 먼저들 하시고 니시노 선생님 하시면서 종료를 해야 될것 같습니다. 예. 네, 질문 위주로 짧게 코멘트 해 주시면 좋겠습니다. Thank you very much. I'm Lee Fair Geesley from Ehua Women's University. Excellent panel. My question is to Professor Shi. Uh, my understanding is that China prioritizes stability over denuclearization. and conflict avoidance over peace building, even though China uh, thinks all those concepts are very important. Um, and when I think about how the hard-earned gains of diplomacy in 2018 might be lost, and we might regress back into the more conflictual risk uh, space of 2017, I actually think that one path to that negative outcome would be the seizure of another ship like the Wise Honest, which would then lead North Korea to perhaps conduct another ICBM test, which would then lead the United States to take robust uh, countermeasures. And I don't think that that's a path that Beijing wants to see the region uh, take. So my question to you is, I wonder if President Xi would raise with uh, Chairman Kim in his meetings in the next couple of days, North Korea's illegal ship-to-ship -ship transfers that, that violate UN Security Council resolutions, it, as those can bring us to that sort of negative outcome. Thank you. 네, 다음 니시노 교수님. Thank you for informative and uh, very insightful discussion. Uh, my question goes to the Dr. Cho Son Yeol and the President Januzi. 조선열 박사님에게 질문 드리겠는데요. 그 3자, 4자 얘기 상당히 관심 있게 들었습니다. 그 군사적인 긴장 완화에 있어서 놓쳐서 어, 안 되는 현재 진행증의 문제 중에 하나가 전작권 전환 문제라고 생각이 됩니다. 아, 현재 문재인 정부는 그 임기 내, 즉 22년 범까지의 전환을 으, 으, 생각 중이라고 듣, 듣고 알고 있습니다만 어, 한편으로는 북학 북핵 피해카 북한 문제 피해카 진전이 없이는 음, 전작권 전환이 어렵지 않겠는가라는 의견도 있는 것을 알고 있, 있습니다. 그 부분에 대해서 박사님의 견해를 듣고 싶었고요. I also I also appreciate the comment uh, or assessment on this issue from the pre, President Januzi. Uh, especially, is, is it possible for, from your perspective to realize of the, the transfer of con uh, under the Moon Jae-in administration? Or uh, so, if so, or we will have only three years. So, how about your assessment on this issue? Thank you. Yeah, sure. yeah thank, thanks so much for the question, Nishino Sensei. Um, no, it's not possible to uh, have OPCON transfer. Uh, South Korea is not ready, and the denuclearization, uh, the absence of progress on denuclearization greatly complicates OPCON transfer. And I'm not optimistic that OPCON transfer will be realized anytime soon. I think it would require many years uh, of con considerable additional investment by the ROK before OPCON transfer will be realized, even though it is clearly the mutual objective of the US and South Korea to realize uh, peacetime OPCON uh, transfer. Um, and I, let me just say uh, on the trust issue, um, it's not possible uh, for President Donald Trump to uh, achieve trust uh, on any issue. Uh, he has lied 11,000 times in office. Uh, he does not keep his contracts. He does not keep his marriage vows. So uh, trust is not the, the, the goal in U.S. DPRK relations. There will not be trust. Um, that does not mean there cannot be progress. Uh, the progress that can be achieved must not be dependent upon trust, because trust is not an achievable objective 
with a president who does not have integrity. Um, so uh, this is a, one of the complicating aspects of the relationship. But in the absence of trust, you set up mechanisms that are more reliable. So I like to use the analogy of a car. Uh, if we have a roadmap and we know where we're going, uh, this peace process, uh, I want Moon Jae-in behind the wheel of the car. I want Donald Trump in the front seat riding shotgun, and we can give him a steering wheel that is not connected to the wheels. So he can hold the steering wheel and he can feel that he has some control, but that steering wheel should not be connected to the wheels of the car. In the back seat, we need two players. We need Kim Jong-un and we need Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping needs to pay for the gasoline for the car and buy the food for the road trip. And Kim Jong-un needs to be along for the ride. And in the trunk of the car, we have Prime Minister Abe and Putin. While they are in the trunk, maybe they can work out their differences together. And when they have solved their differences, we can let them out of the trunk and invite them back into the car. But they need to be along for the ride also, because ultimately the peace process will require multilateral support. Because when you don't have trust, what you have is peer pressure. Right? Peer pressure to try to compel the parties to uphold their their commitments. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent question. I think that the general situation at present, of course, is far from you know what Jin Jong want in a very beneficial you know state. Is also not what Trump think in a very beneficial state. But they could coexist with this much mitigated compared with past situation. And uh, this situation is based on so-called double suspense. And North Korea up to now have not made any you know, nuclear test, any middle range and long range test. I don't think that uh, this kind of situation, Jin Jong have any obligation or any, any you know, de deliberation to change it. He is, he is satisfied, minimally, with this. And uh, Mr. Trump is also. So, and, and also, if Mr. Trump want to reverse to some older policy similar with his policy in 27, domestic situation in the United States were not permitted. If you look at, you know, the, the up to now administration was still prudent policy in launching military, you know, attack and against Venezuela and against Iran. And I think that the, all the, you know, Iran situation become more dangerous than before, but still uh, administration in Washington take a conservative approach. Because in this juncture, if any president launch some large scale military attack, it could be very difficult to receive support from con Congress with, or from the, with, even within administration itself, let alone from uh, 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 a public opinion. So it's, I don't think that the, it's likely that both King and uh, Trump were reversed to very dangerous situation like it was in city in 2017. And uh, so-called illegal traffic of oil by North Korea. I don't think that the, 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 the Xi Jinping will raise this issue in the summit. China, North Korea relations now is okay. And Xi Jinping want to boost it, improve it even further. And the more important issue and is that the, he would like to persuade Jin, Jin Jong-un to go a few steps in the direction of further, you know, to, towards the objective of further mitigation of its relation with Washington or third summit or something. In this kind of situation, and taking into account of Jin Jong-un's self, proud, self-respect, 
I personally believe that Xi Jinping will not raise this issue in the summit. If I don't think that he will raise, if it might be raised, Jin Zhuan will give a, a face of highly dissatisfaction. Then our leader will shut his mouth. He will not raise this issue. This is a small issue in China's eyes, in North Korea's eyes, of course. And in Western eyes, this is a big issue. And uh, I asked the Chinese to tell the Western audience, okay. In 2017, we sacrificed our important interests to almost to conduct uh, economic strangulation against North Korea. This policy gave us almost nothing. We were not repeated while we still implement Security Council's sanction resolution. And Dr. Zhu, could you be brief? Yes, I'll try. Well, until spring uh, 2010, although it's not uh, finalized in the past, the OPCON uh, negotiation was, uh, the target was to have transfer by 2015 and or 2012, but it was delayed. But um, back then, when there were delay, there were conditional uh, they said um, if the condition are meet, met, then the, it will be transferred. So at that time, the nuclear weapon of the North Korea was an issue. But I do not believe nuclear uh, weapon is the key condition for such a transfer. But the dilemma currently is the two satisfy conditions. We need to have a we need to build up our own military capabilities. But if we do that, the drive to um, denuclearize would go down for uh, South North Korea. So if possible, personally, I think within the President Moon's term, we need to have upcoming transfer. And after that, after the upcoming transfer is completed, then various lacking areas uh, could be um, supplemented and complemented. Because the key is, that although the decision was recent, uh, and with the uh, upcon transfer as a uh, precondition, the future uh, command control uh, will not be with the uh, Ministry of Defense, but will be Pyeongtaek where the uh, U.S. Army is uh, stationed. So uh, they are trying to offer the shock, even if there's an upcon uh, transfer, such a negotiation going on between U.S. and uh, Iraq. So without uh, decoupling with the denuclearization, if the condition met, I think there will be upcon transfer. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I think um, this uh, session had a, a good uh, discussion, but unfortunately, I was not able to give much opportunity to the floor to make your comments. But I do believe similar topic will be discussed in the afternoon. So hopefully, there will be more in-depth discussion in the afternoon. And with that, I would like to conclude this first session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ko and our panel of experts for their engaging discussions on the situation on the Korean Peninsula. Now, that brings us to the end of session one. We will now stop for a short lunch break. Now, luncheon for our ambassadors and panelists will take place on the second floor, and lunch for our general guests will be served here um, at the Grand Ballroom. So please be back by 2 p.m. because that's when our second session will begin. And enjoy your lunch. Thank you.